Jason explains quantum computing because Bill Gates can't. Google smart jacket is here, but I'm still waiting for my smart pants. And we discuss Mark Zuckerberg's superhero defense. All that and more coming up on Tech News Today. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Tech News Today is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Tech News Today, episode 1860, recorded Monday, September 25th, 2017. This episode of Tech News Today is brought to you by Rocket Mortgage by Quicken Loans. Home plays a big role in your life. That's why Quicken Loans created Rocket Mortgage. It lets you apply simply and understand the entire mortgage process fully so you can be confident that you're getting the right mortgage for you. Get started at rocketmortgage.com slash TNT. Welcome to Tech News Today. This is a show where we take the tech news, we toss it on a frying pan, we shake it until it starts to pop, 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 pop and then we eat it. Oh, wow. But <laughs> you know what? While we're doing that, we put on our technology apron because we don't want all of that, that greasy tech news to get on our clothes and, and ruin them forever. Mm -hmm. I'm Megan Maroney. I'm Jason Howell. How's it going? It was, it was, it was a weekend. Did you have a good weekend? I had a great weekend. I okay. uh, did some traveling around the town, saw some friends, uh, good conversations, spent a lot of time on Twitter, probably more time than I should have. Mm -hmm. You? Yeah, I think so. Um, yeah, did did a little of this, a little of that. Was on the new screensavers with oh, Rich right. Camuro. Mm -hmm. Had fun uh, there. You know, it was a great weekend. I listened but to that while happened. I was folding oh, laundry. Did, oh, you did? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Wow. Check, checking up on, on the screensavers. It's what I like to listen to the pre-show. Okay. Uh, and you guys were just chatting, and I felt like I was there, but I was also <laughs> folding my laundry. All right, it's a good way to get through your laundry. I yeah, understand that. That's how I watch the new screensavers. Excellent. Hashtag. Another company in charge of protecting our valuable personal information reports that they've been hacked. Deloitte, dedicated to auditing risk management and tax-related services, says a cyber attack has exposed some customer information, including passwords and personal emails, from the company's blue-chip clients, The Guardian reports. Hackers gained access to one of the world's four biggest accounting firms through an administrator's account last year, but the attack was only discovered in March, uh, the company says hasn't said which clients or which companies have been affected. They have said very few, quote, very few clients have been affected. Who knows what that means? Look the other way. Uh, yeah, nothing to see here. Have you heard what happened to Equifax? That's right. what they said. Um, and you could probably guess this, but they got through the account uh, because it didn't have two-factor on. Oh, okay. That's that's one common way of doing it. Uh, they are one of the world's four big four accounting firms, so no small potatoes. Uh, Deloitte ranked number one globally in security consulting based on revenue in 2012. So obviously a big deal. Um, and if you uh, definitely check out Brian Krebs wrote about this, he has, as he usually does with these stories, he has his own kind of sources that have come to him and everything. Apparently, so they're saying that the breach dates back to at least fall of 2016, but Krebs sources say the company isn't quite exactly sure when it happened, how long it lasted for, exactly how much was taken at that time. They're also, Guardian also has sources that say that investigators still aren't even so sure that they've completely removed the, the intruders from the network. So once again, it feels kind of like a, a, clueless, a state of clueless confusion. Like when you leave the window open and then you come home and there's a bird inside your house flapping all around. <laughs> or a burglar. Like, or, or, I mean, a bird. For me, is scarier than a burglar. Yeah, birds they just they carry bird flu and <laughs> that's, they're terrifying. That's true. I, and yeah, yeah you don't know how that. long they've been there. Uh -huh. They might have stolen things. You don't know. You just know there's damage and a whole lot of it, mm -hmm. uh, but you don't know mm -hmm. to the extent. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's just. Uh, it, I, I swear, every single day it's a new one, and uh, I just feel like this is the story. This is it nowadays. There's too many targets. Uh, too many, uh, you know, there's a, there's a lot to gain from these targets. And apparently there's a lot of people who are very cluelessly protecting companies that ca that hold a lot of valuable sensitive data. And uh, that needs to change. Mm -hmm. The criminals are very organized. And it yeah. seems that the businesses, <laughs> right. not so much. Yeah, the security uh, involved with the organization isn't nearly as organized as the criminals are. 
Uh, Microsoft Ignite is underway in Orlando, Florida, and of the many enterprise-focused announcements the company made, one stood out, at least to me. Microsoft says its new programming language for quantum computers should be out by the end of the year, even though the technology, I mean, it's still kind of a theoretical uh, years away from any form of practicality. But Microsoft has been working on quantum computing for a decade or longer at this point. Uh, they're hardly alone, of course, in this pursuit, along with notables like IBM and Google, among a whole lot of other companies that are trying to get in this because everybody sees this as kind of like the next, you know, one of the big next major waves in computing. Uh, this language is unnamed at the moment. They didn't even give it a name, but it, does have, it will have full Visual Studio integration, uh, including simulators, quantum computing simulators, one that can be done locally if you've got 32 gigs of RAM to start on your machine, uh, and then one that can run in the cloud on Azure. Yeah, I, I read this story and I was thinking, God, I should do some research on a quantum computing. And then I read this interview in Wall Street Journal that happened today between, I was Sachin Adela and Bill Gates being interviewed at the Wall Street Journal. And they asked them to explain quantum computing. And they were like, uh, uh, well, no, they both, I mean, I understand it. It's just really hard to put it into words. <laughs> Basically, that's what they said. I mean, they asked him, explain it to my 72 year, explain it in a sentence to my 72 year old grandmother or something. And Sachin Nadella said, oh, well, we can't really explain it in a sentence. And Bill Gates was like, I don't really understand it at all. Like that, he's like, that's the one thing that I never really understood. Like I get the math, I get the science, I understand all this, but then they put the quantum computing stuff uh, up in the slides and he said it was like hieroglyphics. So I'm with Sacha and Bill. Um, I don't even really understand it, but um, it's cool and exciting. Let me try it. Let me try and do my best. Let me <laughs> okay, do what Bill Sasha Gates. Nadella and Bill Gates could not do. Okay, Bill uh, and this is purely based on stuff I read today. Okay. Uh, <laughs> uh, quantum computing, basically it handles processing differently than what we have right now. What we have right now is basically a register is on or off. It has it can only hold one state at one time, right? It's either on or off, it's a zero or a one, and that limits the capability of the of the computing. Quantum computing uh, uses uh, molecules and atoms to handle the processing and the memory. And what that allows for, apparently, is multiple states simultaneously. So instead of something having a one and a zero, it can have exponentially way more states simultaneously. Uh, superposition, I believe, is what that's called. Um, and so that allows for exponentially more computing power as it scales up. Um, they, see, they weren't able to explain it, but they but they were able to create a language about it, uh, like for it. So that's interesting. Well, I mean, Bill Gates didn't create that. Language. Well, that's true. He's been that's retired right. for a while. <laughs> uh, Nadella and Microsoft. And Nadella said he couldn't explain it to uh, the Wall Street Journal reporter, seventy-two-year-old yeah. grandmother, in one sentence. And <laughs> one you, sentence to be might fair, be a you challenge. You also didn't use that's one true. sentence, but you did a great job. <laughs> um, so they're they're behind. I mean, IBM, Google, both also doing this, but they're a little behind them. Um, so they they better catch up. Yeah. And you can you can if you want to be involved, you can sign up today. Yep, and uh, get get to work. Uh, very. I don't know if it's out right now. Uh, those simulators and the Visual Studio integ integration, but I think by the end of the year, you're gonna have the ability to do that. Uh, those bits, by the way, are called qubits. Hmm. So the the qubits are the ones where you can have a bunch of different things happening at once inside of them. It's Mac now. OS High Sierra Day, and you should install it where you can for no other reason than it will now let you stop auto playing audio in Safari. And you know what I'm talking about. You go to a website and it's like, ah, la, 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 la. And you don't <laughs> want it. And you're sitting in a quiet office. If you upgrade, you'll also have access to the new Apple file system with an advanced architecture that's supposed to make your computer more responsive and more secure. Plus Siri on the Mac, as well as Spotlight Search on the Mac now uses Google instead of Bing because Apple, I guess, decided they want you to find what you're looking for. Other features include the ability to take Ooh. live photos in FaceTime, EFI Check, which is a tool that checks your system firmware weekly. You probably won't notice it, but it's doing good things under the hood. Uh, and better facial recognition, so I can find all the photos I've taken of you, Jason, <gasps> to make you a birthday collage next oh, year. Oh, just what I've wanted for my birthday. Pictures of me. <laughs> I, I thought you would want that. <laughs> But the really good ones that I can turn into profile photos, mm -hmm. you know, then I can mm -hmm. put them to use. Right. Um, yeah. I mean, everybody that's writing about, the, obviously, this update are saying this is definitely one of the uh, Mac OS updates that's more under the hood than it is 
on the surface. Like you're using, you know, some of the re the reviewers have been using it for a week, and from the surface level, would have a hard time really pointing to very much that's that's much different. But there's a lot going on underneath the hood. I'm actually psyched about the APFS uh, file system change, just because that's meant to be more tailored for uh, solid state and flash disks. And I have that set up at home. So, hey, if it's going to be better for that, then great. But I'm probably not going to rush out and update anytime soon, um, mainly because I find when I do that on, on Mac OS, some of the software that I use at home, particularly music production software, it doesn't it doesn't follow compatibility nearly as quickly. Uh, I would love to jump on it, but I end up having to wait like six, eight, ten months before I do it. That's sad. I jumped right it's on it. This little baby's got uh, high Sierra. She's totally high Sierra, um, totally as you can tell. Sierra. And then I got an, an alert on my iPhone saying that my camera format changed to high efficiency format, oh. which is Heath. And that's what um, people are saying, like, oh, have you experienced the heaf? So uh, th that, and that's what saves kind of file size with the new format. Is that right? I, I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> I just know it's heaf and it's uh, it's must be more efficient yeah. and prettier. Yeah. Well, I remember hearing about in iOS that there were, there were going to be some changes that would m make for uh, the pictures that you take and everything uh, to take up a lot less uh, storage space. So I'm imagining the efficiency would help with that. Mm -hmm. Well, this has 256 gigs. So you got nothing to worry about. I can just keep taking pictures of you all day. Yep, and burst I will. mode, like from morning to night. Mm -hmm. Uh huh. That sounds like a good plan. Uh, by the way, the new Safari feature that you were talking about, uh, blocking autoplay ads, that works not just on High Sierra. If you get an update to Safari, uh, you know, I guess there's an update that rolled out today. You'll get that feature. What you won't get is an ad tracker blocking feature that's also coming to Safari that's only going to work for High Sierra, from oh. what I understand. So versions of, of the OS earlier than High Sierra won't get that, um, that ad blocking with Safari. But if you're on High Sierra, block away. Do you use Safari on your no, Mac? I no, I really don't. No, me neither. Uh, Chrome, I learned, will get this uh, stop autoplay yes. uh, update next year. Mm -hmm. so we have to wait till next year to stop because I'm not. I considered it for a minute. Should I make Safari my default browser in order to stop the autoplay? And I thought, nope. Yep. Uh, yeah. There's a lot of changes along that round uh, that road coming to Chrome soon. Uh, Burke has a suggestion. Maybe, maybe he feels. Wow, that's so abstract looking. I love it. Uh, it says, "Don't use Safari. Use if you use AOL." Oh, is that a burn? Is that a yeah, Burke burn? That's a Burke burn. Hmm. That hurt. Right before Mac OS High Sierra began its push to computers everywhere, a security researcher posted a video showing how the OS is vulnerable to a hack that allows for the retrieval of a user's Mac keychain information in plain text, no, no less. That's uh, you know all the passwords and IDs that you've stored through the Mac OS. The keychain usually requires a master password to access, but it appears that the vulnerability sidesteps that requirement entirely thanks to an unsigned app that facilitates the attack that the researcher created to kind of demonstrate how you know how this happened is Patrick Ward only works for Synac. He was a as a researcher in a previous life. He was an NSA hacker. Uh, he says that the vulnerability does exist on High Sierra, but also on previous versions of the Mac OS. And he sent all this information, this material, including the app that kind of demonstrates it to Apple a month ago. Yet the new version shipped without it, and he's he's kind of saying that's unacceptable. Yeah, it kind of is unacceptable. Yeah, so not upgrading isn't going to do anything. Like Choosing to not upgrade. Choosing to not upgrade. Yeah, and, you're, and upgrading. you're still kind of hosed. So upgrading yeah. or not upgrading isn't going to change the fact that you're vulnerable to this. Uh, using a different password manager will change whether you're uh, vulnerable to this. If you don't use Keychain as your password manager, then you're fine. I suppose so. Well, and Keychain is, is deeper than like a browser password manager, right? It's, it's more on the system level. Well, it's an iCloud. Uh, okay, so then it can protect you uh, from. Burke is nodding. Yes, it's more than on the system. Yeah, like it's on the system. Yeah, yeah, it's 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 deeper integrated into the system. So you might be more inclined to use it because it because it appears 
in, in you know throughout the operating system as opposed to just in the browser um and i mean you know you have to imagine that apple is is hard at work on on squashing this but they haven't really at least i couldn't find any comment from them about this it's strange to kind of release this based on information they had a month ago i guess you gotta you gotta of uh, I don't know. You got to cut your losses, though, apparently, and just kind of go public uh, with what you have. I don't know. Like, I feel like maybe this was uh, significant enough that they should have done something about this prior to the release. But yeah, one would think. Yes. Sarah Fryer from Bloomberg sat down with Mark Zuckerberg, and now she's going to sit down with us to tell us what she learned. But first, let's take a minute to thank Rocket Mortgage by Quicken Loans, the sponsor of this episode. If you have gotten a mortgage lately, you probably know that the mortgage experience wasn't keeping up with the times. It was pretty dated. It needed a change. It needed a technological revolution. And that's why Quicken Loans created Rocket Mortgage. Rocket Mortgage gives you the confidence you need when it comes to buying a home or just refinancing your existing loan. It's very easy. You can fully understand all the details and be confident that you're getting the right mortgage for you. Buying a house is frustrating. It's expensive and you want to be able to pay your mortgage and they can figure out whether you can or not. It's convenient. Their trusted partners allow you to share your financial information with Rocket Mortgage at the touch of a button. It's powerful. So whether you're looking to buy your first home or your 10th home, Rocket Mortgage is able to perform thousands of calculations in seconds. Based on your income, assets, and credit, Rocket Mortgage can analyze all of the home loan options for which you qualify and then find the one that is just right for you. Rocket Mortgage by Quicken Loans. Apply simply, understand fully, mortgage confidently. To get started, go to rocketmortgage.com slash TNT. That's rocketmortgage.com slash TNT. Equal housing lender, licensed in all 50 states, NMLS, consumeraccess.org, number 3030. And we thank Rocket Mortgage by Quicken Loans for their support. Sarah Fryer is a reporter covering social media for Bloomberg, which means Facebook and occasionally Snapchat, but these days mostly Facebook. Thanks for joining us, Sarah. Thanks for having me. So you and Max Max Chafkin wrote an excellent long form piece on Mark Zuckerberg. Zuckerberg and Facebook have said uh, time again, time and again, that they don't want to be the arbiters of what's right and what's wrong, or take a political side. But it seems to be getting harder and harder. Uh, how how are you feeling that he? Uh, how good of a job is he doing at being neutral? And is that still his <laughs> aim? Well, Zuckerberg has had a bit of a political awakening over the last few months, and. And I think what we're seeing is is a struggle occur between what he feels um, Facebook's responsibility is, which is you know to be this neutral platform, and then what he feels they need to do to mitigate these threats to uh, society that are occurring on Facebook's platform, like uh, advertising by the Russian government to influence the U.S. election. So it is it's a a very we can sort of see him in public, of course, because he posts all about this on his Facebook profile, go through these these internal decision-making processes about, you know, where he feels Facebook's responsibilities should lie. And it doesn't seem like he's 100% clear. And so I know he gets a little uh, angry when everyone says he's running for president. Did you guys ask him if he was running for president? <laughs> <laughs> well, we we already knew. That. I mean, I were, I'd already asked him before. What we asked him was how, um, you know, if he's not running for president, why did he put a provision in his uh, shareholder agreement revision um, to allow him to take a government spot and still maintain control of Facebook? So if he, if he really isn't interested in government, why did he ask for that? And he told us it was kind of an interesting response, like, well, you know, in the case that the government might need someone to come deal with a threat and I'm the only person that can do it, then I could be able to do that. Kind of like like the a superhero defense, right? Um, but that's all, all null and void because that shareholder lawsuit has been dropped um, because Zuckerberg conceded. He, he doesn't want um, or he doesn't need that voting control anymore. Yeah, explain what that what that what that that happened after you published this piece, right? Explain what was going right. on there. Yes. So in the two days after we published this piece, all sorts of things happened. Um, Zuckerberg, first of all, went and gave this big 
presentation about how Facebook was going to address uh, the Russian spending in the election and, you know, prevent that from happening down the road. And then the next day, he um, there was this this challenge by shareholders to Zuckerberg's plan to um, issue a new class of shares to allow him to maintain voting control. And Zuckerberg was going to go on the stand on Tuesday to try to defend that decision. Um, not a great time for Zuckerberg to be on the stand defending his his power over Facebook in perpetuity. And lucky for Zuckerberg, he is now rich enough because uh, Facebook stock has appreciated so much that he doesn't need that extra class of voting shares, that he can still um, fully fund his philanthropy for the next 20 years without losing majority control of Facebook, which is pretty stunning. So um, it was just a very shocking move because usually in these cases, the shareholders don't win. Um, but in this case, Zuckerberg, you know, couldn't, he didn't really need the publicity of going on being interrogated in, in the trial. Of course, he didn't say that, but um, one can imagine that would be a little much right now. Yeah, it feels like, um, you know, th there's that, there's the Russian in involvement in the ads and Facebook having to hand over ads. There's all, the, you know, everybody on the outside looking into companies like Facebook and Google and, and questioning whether they have too much power, not enough regulation, all this kind of stuff happening. Uh, and it feels like it feels like this has been a big year for all of that, which I'm sure, you know, is a lot of pressure on Zuckerberg and his vision for the company. How do you think that could alter kind of his direction, his approach uh, for Facebook as it's been prior to all of this extra scrutiny and where he's headed right now? I think it's going to alter it quite a bit. I think the number one thing that he's attempting right now, as we as we discussed in our piece uh, last week in Business Week, is he wants to build trust with the community. And a lot of people right now are very skeptical about Facebook's effect on their lives, on society, on their social uh, status. One of the things, one of the big changes he's going to make is um, trying to just create more empathy in the world, which sounds really nebulous. Um, but one way he's going to do it is by um, fixing the uh, groups product on Facebook. Right. Uh, groups is an incredibly popular product. Thousands of, of uh, groups that are very, or sorry, hundreds of thousands of groups that are very meaningful um, to people. But Zuckerberg wants to have a billion meaningful groups. And he wants to give administrators more power to um, monitor them. And he also wants to allow people to connect with, with others that they maybe wouldn't have met through friends or family. Um, he was meeting earlier this year with uh, some recovering addicts. And those addicts told him in Dayton, Ohio, that they would have had a better time uh, getting off the drugs if they had had friends who were sober. And um, that sort of sparked this curiosity in Zuckerberg's mind about, well, what if we did connect people to people they don't know and helped shape their lives? Of course, that requires a lot more intimate knowledge about what you and I need um, and again, we gets us to the push and pull over, you know, how much more power do we want to give Facebook over mm -hmm. our lives? Mm -hmm. That issue of him wanting to to gain trust is really interesting. I mean, you talk, I, I mean, it's very difficult not to make fun of the pictures of him at dinner with a normal family or wearing a NASCAR outfit or milking a cow. And you say that he has like <laughs> a real issue with um uh, anxiety about authenticity is what you write. And, and I, I found that you point that out, that that's, that's what a lot of us are struggling with, with Facebook, like posting stuff. It's gotten to the point where it's like, oh, I just feel like I'm, you know, creating a museum of my life now. This isn't real and there's no way to make it real. Like, is that, <laughs> a good way to put it. <laughs> is that the way that he is feeling that, I mean, because there's Facebook personal sharing is down and, um, you know, is that, do you think that his own anxiety is, is reflecting Facebook itself and how people People in general are feeling about it now? I, right. You make a good point. Like, how is Zuckerberg's um, professional photography at the ranch, the cattle ranch, any different from, you know, what what you have your, uh, your friend take of you in your cutest, latest outfit, right? Um, is that any less posed? 
this is this is a really interesting thing. I didn't expect him to be as frustrated about. So he was frustrated about a story I wrote about the team that manages his Facebook page, um, kind of deleting spam and helping curate and helping him write these things. And he was really frustrated because he was like, well, these are my ideas and this is what I want to do. How is it not me? Um, you're making it seem like everything is fake. And I told him, well, you know, you're investing in, in creating a relationship with your users and the public. That is a strategic business decision. Even if it is, you know, your personal decision, it's still going to reflect on Facebook. So we had this little debate. And yeah, I think I think that's very core to, to what Facebook is. Um, you know, they want people to use it, especially this year, as Zuckerberg thinks about the evolution of the product. They want people to think of it, of using it for more real stuff, right? Like not just the um, the great things that happen to you, although they want those too, but they want you to, to use it to, you know, connect with people who have the same disease as you do or, or who went through the same challenges raising their kids as you did. You know, using Facebook in a way that is deeper than the way we currently use it, um, Although many people, many people are using it in that deep way too, especially on Facebook groups. Um, I, I feel like a, a common story or common denominator about Mark Zuckerberg over the years has been kind of his his style of how he communicates, and I, you know, a, a large part of his tour mm -hmm. across the the country, you know, could be seen as as kind of aiming to help improve his ability to communicate with everyone. You say in the piece that his communication skills aren't as strong as his competitive instincts. What can what? How can you expl explain that? Well, Facebook is just I mean, Zuckerberg, just such a fierce force of competition. I mean, we've seen how they have dealt with Snap, right? Just brazenly copying the uh, features that are most popular. This is, uh, and Zuckerberg is is just one of the most adaptable leaders I've ever seen, which is also very important for competition. He is always seeking to improve himself, to become, um, you know, better versed in, in a new thing. Um, and that is, I mean, in terms of communication, you can tell when you're listening to him, he's, He's very, um, very thoughtful, but also um, a little uncomfortable. Uh, mm -hmm. And so he, he's thinking about his sentences carefully. He's, um, you know, when you ask a question, he waits a beat before answering it, which is, you know, smart. Um, I, 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 that was just to say that, you know, he's, it seems like business competition comes very naturally to him mm -hmm. and that this whole political side of things is maybe less natural. So a lot of people are saying, oh yeah, Facebook's time is up, you know, everything's changing for them. But uh, coincidentally, they've been around mostly during the Obama administration and their real problems have started to happen after that was over. Do you think that is a coincidence? Right, well, for Facebook's, most of the Facebook's existence, it's been the Obama administration. So they really haven't dealt with the challenge of a change in administration before. And I think they, they you know, would have different challenges if it were a Hillary Clinton administration. But yeah, I mean, all of these close ties that they have built up over um, the last decade are, are not useful anymore. And so they kind of have to start from scratch, just like every business. Um, and they have to kind of figure out how to work in this, in this new world. Um, you know, from a regulatory perspective, there are now Congress people calling for them to have tighter rules on election disclosure for advertising spending. Um, and also from just a relationship perspective, you had uh, Bannon when he was at the White House was saying that uh, Facebook should be regulated like a public utility. I mean, those are things that that were never said before. So uh, this is this is definitely a, a change in in tone from Washington, a little bit more pressure, a lot more pressure on these companies than we've seen in the past. Not that Obama, the Obama administration was smooth sailing because we had the Snowden stuff, we had um, net neutrality debates, but this is certainly something that, that tugs more at the core of what Facebook is and how it works. And these Russian ads are, are um, enabled through this self-service advertising system that Facebook really hasn't had to crack down on before in any way. 
So what do you make of the Washington Post story that came out today that Obama actually spoke to to Zuckerberg that that we, you know, we Zuckerberg came out and said, I don't think fake news had anything to do with the election. And then Obama spoke to him right before the inauguration. Does that surprise you? I I think, I mean, you know, these people are always in contact with each other and and you know, Zuckerberg has told people he's had phone calls with Trump several times during his presidency. I I mean, I think that that it's not just Obama who was telling him. And I do think you should read, if you haven't, that Washington Post story, which is full of incredible detail. Um, but I think a lot of people were saying to Zuckerberg, hey, even if fake news was not something that impacted the actual results of the election, we don't know that for sure. Shouldn't you be a little less flippant about it? I mean, shouldn't you be looking into it and answering the questions about it? So Zuckerberg, to his credit, um, took some time off in January and came up with this new vision for the future of Facebook and actually changed the company's mission statement. So it wasn't just, you know, we should probably deal with this fake news thing. It was like, wait, this, this thing that we built uh, focused on connecting the world, it is no longer uh, considered a force for good everywhere. I mean, connecting the world is this, like he says in our story, it wasn't this controversial thing. Now there are these isolationist movements, nationalist movements, um, extremism. You know, what have we done and how can we help mitigate that? So he sort of had this whole awakening about um, Facebook's role in society. And I mean, as far as the changes that that Facebook and, and Zuckerberg have, have made so far going into 2017, I mean, from your gut, do you think that's the right direction? Do you think those are the, the right changes for the for the issue at hand, or are they going to take it even further? Well, I was speaking with an executive the other day who made a really um, interesting point in this background conversation, and he said, you know, it is going to be hard for Zuckerberg in this in the position he's created for himself, where he says that his goals are to make um, society more full of more understanding and empathy, that he wants Facebook to be a force of, of social good. Um, those are those are claims that he's going to have to stand up. Mm -hmm. uh, Facebook has been such an incredible business on a tear. Um, you know, just every earnings period, they, they beat expectations. Um, this is a company that that people haven't really thought of in terms of measured it in terms of, is this a good thing for the world? They've measured it in terms of like, wow, you know, what an incredible business and what an incredible product. Um, this is, this is going to be interesting to see how he deals with the responsibility he's put on himself. If he just gone out there and say, said like, you know, we're a business and um, we're not responsible for this, but uh, we'll do what we can. Uh, maybe people will be reacting differently. But since he's going out there and saying, we want to fix things, people are going to hold him to that. Mm -hmm. Sarah, thank you so much for joining us. Definitely read uh, the Bloomberg Business Week story that uh, Sarah wrote with Max Chafkin. It's Mark Zuckerberg's fake news problem isn't going away. Sarah Fryer is a tech reporter at Bloomberg. She has Sarah Fryer on Twitter. Thanks so much for taking the time to talk to us. Thank you, Sarah. Thanks for having me. It was great Take talking care. with you. All right, feedback time. Nick wrote in about our John Denver idea. Yes, you remember John Denver, but in virtual reality VR. Anyways, uh, with a comment that was mildly related. It's related to VR, at least. Uh, he says, one advantage of VR is, <laughs> this is a nice, uh, nice connection of the dots. <laughs> one advantage of VR is not getting stuck with thousands of overstock game controllers. Dollarama a massive chain in Canada is currently liquidating Wii Guitar Hero Live guitars that are now selling for a mere $4. Got to get one of those. That's cheap. Uh, Dollarama has over a thousand locations, so I can only imagine the size of the warehouse that these were all languishing in. Yeah, and I've seen a ton of like smartphones. Oh, and there we go. We have all of them on. Right wow, those are four dollars. Yeah, wooden spoons and Guitar Hero Live boxes. Uh, man, I should get me one of what those. What would you do with it? I don't know. <laughs>
if it's a guitar, I mean, it's a Guitar Hero guitar, right? I, isn't that not a real guitar? No, it's not. But I've got kids with imaginations. Oh, what? That, they still have. I thought they had tablets. How do they still have their imaginations? I, at the very least, you get ten of those, and you reenact like a, a Black Sabbath concert, and at the end, you you break them on the stage, okay. and you can afford to. All right. Well, next. Although it's horribly wasteful, yeah. don't do that. There were some in the basement at our old oh. studio. Did you take those? No. Um, next time I drive I didn't through, think about it. drive past any uh, garage sale, they always have them. <laughs> That's I'm gonna true. Pick them they up probably do. They yeah. probably do. I'm horribly out of the loop on this stuff. Uh, but yeah, I, I feel like I've seen tons of uh, like third party VR goggles that I have had the same thought, which is like, man, most of these are probably not going to get bought and where do they end up from there? Right. But that's the selling point of our John Den VR. You don't need John Denver's like plastic guitar to play the game. It's all VR. Yeah. John Denver ER. John Vin <laughs> Den VR. Uh, gotta have a dream. TNT's fan of the day <laughs> is at Fiend with a PH on Twitter who sent this pic saying how I watch TNT on my NES. 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 <laughs> I thought it was NAS. And oh, then it was okay. NES. Then NES. Then oh my gosh, so I'm nasty. so ashamed. <laughs> my NES R A S P I running. I'm <laughs> just kidding. Oh, I know that. <laughs> I was like, do I need to step in? <laughs> uh, running Retro Pie with Cody or K O D I <laughs> and a recycled McDonald's monitor. <laughs> McDonald's monitor. What? In my man cave. A McDonald's In my M A N C A V E. <laughs> Thank you. I wasn't sure that last one. I uh, know Raspi. Yeah. Cool. Raspberry Pi. <laughs> thank you. Um, Thank you, at Fiend, and thank you all of you for laughing with me and at me. Show us how you watch or listen to TNT. We will not edit that out. Record a video or take a picture of yourself or your setup and post it to Instagram, Google+, Twitter, or Facebook. Use the hashtag HowIWatchTNT, and we are going to find it. That's right. Uh, hooray, just in time for a handful of you to buy one. Levi's has finally brought its commuter trucker jacket to market. It's the one made in partnership with Google as part of Project Jacquard. That's the company's experimental touch-sensitive fabric effort. They showed this off at of Google I.O. I think two years ago and then again last year. Or maybe it was three years ago and then the year before uh, after that. In the last, I can't even remember at this point. It was a long time ago. Uh, the jacket pairs with your smartphone to allow a patch of the fabric on the sleeve to control aspects of your device with four programmable gestures. So the, the fabric is actually interweaved with this uh, this electronic technology. So it's not like a panel underneath. It's fully flexible. I mean, it, it's, it's really, it was very interesting to, to see it in person a few years ago and kind of interact with it. It really does work the way you think it's going to when you see them just kind of swiping on the sleeve. It actually, you know, sends control signals to your phone. So it's, it, it's tailored exclusively for bike riders. Like it's the idea behind it, bicycle riders, the idea is that when you're riding through the city or whatever, the last thing you want to have to do is like to pull out your phone because someone's calling or whatever. In this case, you can control your music, uh, answer calls, all that kind of stuff on your sleeve. Am I too much of a mom to say it's not safe to listen to music on headphones while you're riding a bike? Mm, I mean, I, I, I would agree. Uh, but there are a lot of people that do it anyways. It's a nice looking jacket. Uh, yeah, it does look pretty nice. Uh, I mean, the, you know, they have the non-tech version of this that costs one hundred forty-eight dollars, and it's a it's a slick looking jacket. This costs three hundred and fifty dollars. Both hands on bars, says Burke, except for when you're at a stoplight or mm -hmm. or a stop sign or something. So something that bicyclists do. The thing that I'm upset about is they promised smart pants. When they oh. announced Jacquard, it was smart pants. That's what they were talking about. And I want my smart pants, and I won't stop asking for smart pants until they get me smart pants. Someday. Okay. Someday. When, when this is proven to be a raging success, then you will get your smart pants, Megan. That does not sound <laughs> promising. Mm -mm. I'm not so sure. I suppose we'll see how, how well it does. Uh, it did take a while, but um, they were quick to point out that, you know, Clothing and kind of the, the cycle of releasing clothing is different than technology. You don't just release a commuter jacket that's perfect in the fall and winter uh, in the summer. Uh, so they waited until the fall time period to release it. I don't know. I, you, you don't seem convinced. Are they, are they trying to claim that it's harder to develop and produce clothing than it is technology? 
I think they're just <laughs> no. I don't think they're necessarily saying that. They're just saying that the retail channels follow a different type of schedule, right? Jackets like this sell in the fall. They right. don't necessarily sell in the spring or the summer. And so the reason they waited, but they, at least they one had, reason they, they waited went is because through several of that. falls. I know, it's true. They did. But they also had to, you know, get the technology working. Pro I don't know. I'm apologizing for them. I don't know why. I, I doubt why these either. are going to sell very well. I don't know. But when you, <laughs> yeah, you should you should get a review unit based on your the nice way you treated this. I would be the worst person to get a review unit of this because most jackets don't fit me anyways, uh -huh. let alone jacket with technology. I am, I am far outside of the standard, like, uh, I, I mean, my arms are just freakishly long basically. Then it's not a very smart jacket at all. Nope. Now, if it could extend, then I would totally buy one. $350? Like no Back to the deal. Future, remember? His, yeah. yeah, I know. That's what we need. Yeah. So work on that, mm -hmm. Jacquard. <laughs> TNT records live every Monday through Friday at 4 p.m. Pacific, 7 p.m. Eastern, 2300 UTC at twit.tv slash live. You can be part of the show by emailing us, tnt at twit.tv. Leave us a short voicemail at 260-TNT-SHOW and find us on Twitter at Tech News Today TV. Subscribe to our show at twit.tv slash TNT. Subscribe for yourself. Subscribe for your friends. Subscribe for your enemies. And if you want to tweet at me to tell me when my smart pants are coming, I am at Megan Maroney. <laughs> they're in the mail. I promise they're in the mail. I'm at Jason Howell on Twitter. Thanks to Kevin for editing and being our technical director and caller of people and, and being awesome. Thanks to Burke for also being awesome, but also helping out here in the studio and occasional thumbs up. And thanks to you for talking tech with us today. We'll see you all tomorrow. Bye, everybody.